Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tarek Odali from Business Review and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have BMW Tech with us today, who will be discussing portable Roman analysis for novel vaccines. Today's guest speakers are Dr. Marina Kirkatadze from Sanofi Pasteur Analytical Research and Development, Toronto site, and Dawn Yang, Applications Manager. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar platform on 24. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect for any reason, please just click on the link that you received via email to rejoin the session. In order to ask questions, you can send them in via the questions widget. So just type them into that box at the top left-hand corner of your screen and click Submit. We will allocate around 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts you may have. If you click on the survey widget, there are a few questions in there for you to answer in order to provide feedback, and you can do this during or immediately after the webinar. If you click on the green resource list widget, you'll be able to view or download some PDF files relevant to this webinar. Please use the yellow help widget if you require any assistance, and you can move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you to get a better view of the slides. But now, without any further ado, please allow me to welcome Dr. Marina Kirkatadze. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, today, uh, Don and I will um, introduce the capability of uh, portable IRAMAN instrument and the applications uh, developed so far. So, um, in Sanofi Pasteur, Toronto site, we have analytical R&D um, uh, and um, um, in it uh, bio biochemistry platform. I'm responsible for um, the biophysics unit um, in the biochemistry platform, and uh, part of um, my responsibility is to uh, bring new technologies, develop them, and find applications for current projects, ongoing projects, and uh, also planting for future well, to anticipate potential need that we can address in timely manner. So um, basically, that's, uh, that's the um, purpose of today's presentation and um, the summary that we collected so far. Uh, so basically, um, the contributors are um, Kamaljit Bandal and Sasmi Desmuk. Um, we started um, basically evaluation of uh, IRAMAN last year. And um, um, after two feasibility studies with um, uh, Don and Thomas, we, we got uh, the instrument installed. And I think since October last year, we're generating our own results and uh, learning as we go. So um, basically, um, before, just to get the outline, so uh, today I would like to quickly touch base about principles of Raman spectroscopy. What are the main business drivers? Um, and then um, applications such as biological raw materials identification, vaccine components identification, and also um, characterization of aluminum adjuvant and raw material that is used to prepare it. So um, the slide three over right now, and uh, basically to overview of the um, uh, spectroscopy. So as you know, the um, uh, principle of Raman spectroscopy is based on the inelastic light scattering. So basically what it means in elastic light scattering, we're all familiar with light scattering and we know that um, about 99.99% of uh, all scattering is Raleigh scattering, it's what we really see. But only uh, 10 to minus 5% um, percent of it, so 1 in 10,000 uh, part, is the light that um, while um, reflected from the um, um, particle, from the molecule, is changing the frequency. So there is a shift between the frequency of incident light and the scattered light by the molecule. And that happens because the induced polarization of the uh, dipole of the molecule um, um, basically causes this shift. It was predicted um, by Smikal in 1923, and in 1928 it was demonstrated um, uh, experimentally uh, by um, Raman and uh, by Sriram. Uh, and so basically after that, um, I think until 1960s, um, the spectroscopy was very hard to use and was mainly residing in the physics laboratories. However, with um, creation of laser and um, widespread use, 
it became um, you know, more practical, more available for many researchers, including industrial researchers. And so now we see the benefits of all technology and uh, development that done in the years and can apply um, re relatively easily to most of our samples of those that, have, uh, that are Raman active as molecules. So basically on the slide you can see the um, uh, energy diagram. So basically after the oscillation of, of the um, molecule, of, um, uh, excitation of the molecule, it shifts to so-called virtual uh, energy levels so, and very quickly returns. And that's really that generates Raman a spectrum, Raman peaks. So um, our main business driver, of course, is to identify raw materials because, um, as you know, um, pharmaceutical companies are responsible uh, now uh, to uh, have their own means to prove the identity of raw materials, not just rely solely on COA from vendors. So it becomes more and more emphasized by regulators, and so this is one of the motivation to um, uh, increase the use of uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy. And of course, um, to apply uh, for characterization of novel vaccines, uh, novel um, components of vaccines that uh, may contribute, complement to existing characterization packages we have, and also potentially address uh, stability issues. Uh, but for now, we humbly uh, focus on the identity. So on the next slide, um, yes, and I forgot to say that um, right in the corner you see the um, um, picture of uh, IRAMA spectrometer that we have. It's um, a 785 nanometer laser. And on the above it, it's a schematic diagram, the basically how it's designed. And so the next slide um, is just briefly advantages of Raman uh, spectroscopy. So. Um, First, it doesn't require special accessories. It doesn't require cooling of the detector, although uh, there are instruments which have that and uh, have more sensitivity. But for portable, you don't need. And still, you can record um, um, quite nice spectrum, uh, informative spectrum from the uh, components uh, that you intend to investigate. Um, another um, uh, good part is that uh, you don't need um, uh, significant preparation. Sometimes you don't prepare a sample at all. You just analyze as is in a glass vial uh, or in quartz. Um, and um, basically, um, um, in some cases, you will see on the slides we did some preparation uh, to increase the signal. And so uh, potentially can be used for quantitation for concentration of the sample. But of course, the main attraction is that it's non-destructive method. It can uh, work on solid and a liquid raw material, and you can go directly through the glass and through the plastic. And uh, uh, this is really the main um, attribute that, um, for example, was um, quite attractive to us. And so uh, here you see example of the Tylenol. We used it during the installation and um, qualification of the instrument. Um, but on a regular basis, uh, we'll use cyclohexane to check the instrument before it works, and we call it system suitability uh, test before every uh, measurement, every, every experimental day. So on the next slide, um, <clears throat> the business need as discussed, it's um, to develop a robust method for the raw materials identity. So basically to have ability to check um, and confirm identity of raw materials, uh, not just uh, for commercialized vaccines that already um, usually done in um, uh, quality labs, in QC labs, but also to do so for the uh, novel vaccines, which are still in clinical trials, uh, but to introduce very early on uh, the controls for the raw materials. Um, then examine the um, effect of raw material coming from different vendors on the properties of vaccine components to have uh, predictability and to anticipate potential issues. And on the other hand, compare, because for, uh, as you know, for business continuity, you need to uh, see um, and compare um, the um, <clears throat> raw materials from different vendors uh, so that you can always ensure that you have sufficient supply. Uh, and, um, uh, and of course, the identity of vaccine components itself, and you may ask why. Uh, the main reason is to support formulation, because during formulation, very often, um, the, the vials and the, the, um, the compounds look very similar. And so um, it's mainly driven by procedure and um, by segregation of the uh, uh, components during formulation. However, 
uh, we thought that if we have a tool which can confirm identity of um, constituents of vaccine uh, during formulation, that way we have extra check to prevent mistakes and uh, to make sure that everything is done correctly. So, um, again, uh, so the part one is uh, biological raw materials. Basically, we'll be, uh, we'll be showing examples uh, how to um, uh, measure with this instrument um, of peptide and oligonucleotide raw material. So, um, <clears throat> for us, raw materials previously was mostly um, in organic compounds and organic compounds, but now uh, with um, um, modern vaccines, that uh, in development pipeline, uh, we have a need to also look at the biological raw materials. And uh, as you know, uh, not all the time you have capability to do it as is without any dilution, preparation, and so forth. So in this case, we were able to find conditions. Um, so basically conditions, I mean in this case, is exposure time, so how long you collect Raman spectrum and the laser power, which you can vary, say, between 60 to 100 percent. And so uh, here you see um, um, basically an array of graphs um, of spectra collected for the same uh, peptide at a different exposure time. And at some point, um, at 100 percent laser power, you see that the signal saturates, completely saturates. However, depending on the region on the spectrum, which you specifically interested and uh, want to choose as an um, uh, identity, um, um, this part can be highlighted. In this case, you don't uh, concern yourself with the saturation of it. However, for us, since we're uh, still on the learning curve, we prefer to have full spectrum and uh, to highlight uh, three regions where we see uh, peaks. And those regions are between 3,000 to uh, 2,800 uh, reverse centimeters, which is uh, normally responsible for CH, CH stretch, um, C triple bond to CH2, um, and so um, that part, uh, which is matching um, the um, structure of peptide. And also um, the region um, between um, 1,500 and 1,700 um, reverse centimeters, which again is double carbon-carbon uh, bond and NH2, and also C double bond to N. Um, and this is just one peak you can see, and um, and there are five peaks between 1,000 and 800, and uh, this region is normally responsible for C, um, uh, so carbon-oxygen-carbon -carbon, um, um, bonds, and um, um, carbon to OH bonds. So basically, um, we're thinking that um, this region is uh, more rich. Uh, however, we still want to uh, account for one peak in around 1,700 and also a uh, uh, few peaks uh, between 3,000 and 200, uh, 2,800. So basically, this is um, a description we can put, and also specific peak position, which I'm not showing here, but exact peak positions that repeat from measurement to measurement. So that would be identity for um, for the um, uh, compound, and of course um, uh, we we um, will be using software uh, WID um, uh, where we can collect um, three spectrum uh, three spectra of the same compound and have it in the library and compare against the um, uh, any unknown to confirm identity. Okay, so. Um, the same procedure was applied for uh, oligonucleotide, and as you can see in this case, um, there is almost no vibration occurring uh, in the region between 3,000 to 2,800, so there are no CH2 groups, uh, no CH stretches. Uh, however, you see that in the region um, closer to 800 reverse centimeters, uh, there is a significant peak, and there are also a few peaks in, um, um, at around 1,100 reverse centimeters also. So um, these peaks um, basically, again, um, can be interpreted as CH double bond, um, then um, carbon oxygen carbon, carbon OH, and uh, uh, CH2 uh, in this case, and also uh, double bond uh, carbon. So this um, course, um, um, basically correlates well with um, a structure of the uh, oligonucleotide. 
and so uh, predictable that you would see um, the um, basically the resonances of the uh, of the peaks in that region. Also. And um, um, there are very small peaks closer to 1,000, which we can also interpret as um, presence of PO um, contribution. <coughs> so on the next slide, again, we, we chose the exposure time and laser uh, power. And so if we overlap now the two graphs, uh, one from peptide and another one from oligonucleotide, you can see that definitely uh, between the um, two vials with uh, white powder, you can uh, differentiate between these two compounds. And uh, this is essential for, for formulation because uh, one of these compounds is a majority. Um, it's a major component during formulation. Another one is um, added um, in much less quantities. How, so um, to prevent any mistakes, it's, it's really important to confirm. But uh, of course, um, just aside from formulation, um, the whole um, point of uh, gathering and collecting so-called baseline of the raw material from a um, given vendor is to prevent in the future um, appearances of um, um, potential um, impurities um, and detect these impurities in the raw materials very early. Also, uh, to um, I think it's it's still more in the future, but um, also thinking forward about the stability of the raw material to check um, through its lifetime how long it can last in, um, in our uh, setting and uh, uh, basically when it's uh, the cutoff time, when it's the shelf lifetime uh, for it to not to be used any anymore. Uh, so um, it's um, from batch to batch obviously can vary, but nevertheless um, that could be a uh, good tool to to follow. So um, the result um, um, in conclusions for this uh, part uh, is that um, we demonstrated that Iraman Plus is um, capable to collect, um, and um, we found conditions where it's uh, collecting uh, informative and distinguishable well-resolved spectrum uh, for peptide and uh, the same um, um, can be said about the oligonucleotide. And so as a result, um, um, Raman spectra is applicable uh, to identify uh, raw materials. And uh, that can be used in future for collecting baselines and also to uh, monitor stability. Um, so we learned that 70% of laser power in case of peptide and um, exposure time of 40 seconds, uh, this is the optimal conditions to collect uh, peptide spectrum. Um, and then laser power of 80% and 70 seconds was optimal to collect the spectrum for oligonucleotide. So these conditions we continue to use. Um, what we also learned that very often for each compound you have to select uh, certain conditions and um, you may not be able to uh, have the same conditions for say two or three uh, different compounds. Uh, for each of uh, the conditions would be unique because the purpose is really to have rich spectra with um, well-defined peaks that can be identified again and again um, um, during the measurement. Um, so we're basically learning that this is suitable um, technology, a suitable instrument, and Raman spectroscopy is suitable technology to identify and characterize raw material going forward, um, specifically biological raw material. So if we move to the next part, uh, the next part is the um, Raman spectroscopy um, examples to characterize vaccine components. In this case, we um, look at uh, drug substance, at the buffer, a vaccine formulation, and I think right now we're on slide 11. At this point, I hand uh, it back to Tariq, and he will introduce you to the poll question. Back yes, thank you very much. Um, so I think now is the time for the uh, first poll in today's session. So uh, please, audience members, could you please select uh, the option that's most relevant for you and click Submit. So I'll just read the question. The question is, what kind of spectrum would you expect to see the emulsion? And the, uh, the options are majority of peaks in the 500 to 1500 wave number region, no peaks in the 500 to 1500 wave number region, few peaks in the 2500 to 3000 wave number region, no peaks below 500 wave number, few peaks below 500 wave number. And uh, Marina, what do you think the uh, result of this poll will be? Just to give the audience some time to vote. 
Um, so they need to probably guess what regions would be more prominent, consider that it's emulsion and um, the oil, so just a hint. But um, they also perhaps can draw on their experiences working with this uh, compound. All right, lovely. I think uh, I think that's given them enough time to vote, so we can uh, move on to the results now. Sure. And uh, there we go. We see that the um, majority have gone with the first option there. Is that something Ex you expected to see? Excellent. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we just thought that um, poll question will engage the audience and um, just make presentation more interactive. So uh, if we can go to next slide um, here, so you can see that yes, indeed, we have basically CH groups and CH2 groups, and indeed, uh, CH2 is mainly in a, a small peak around 3,000 to 2,800, and of course, the majority is CBG. So that's, um, that's all good. Um, so basically, we're looking here at the squalene. This is our uh, component. It's not, um, we call, sometimes call it vehicle as well. And uh, this is used for um, uh, manufacturing or for formulation of one of vaccine components. So um, as you can tell, the spectrum is quite informative, but maybe it's not um, optimal. So therefore, on the next slide, we again go through um, the exercise of exposure time and laser power. And basically, we're learning that um, at certain region, uh, at certain condition, we have um, uh, quite well resolution, um, well resolved peaks um, again in the region between uh, 1500 to um, uh, 1000. And again, around 1000, additionally, two peaks which we definitely can count on. And uh, of course, the region. Um, um, below 500, we see a few peaks. Uh, however, they less resolved, but nevertheless can be taken into account, at least when we compare how this um, compound, this squalene compound, is uh, mixing with the others, and so trying to uh, see uh, the remnants of the, uh, of the spectrum. So basically, on the next slide, um, we see how it's now mixed. So. Uh, squalene is added to another component, and that's uh, becoming um, uh, one of the drug substances. And so as a result, you can see that some peaks uh, resemble um, uh, the squalene and also appear new, uh, especially in the region uh, around 1700, the sharp peak. Um, this is new distinct peak, and so if um, we overlay the spectrum, and at some point you will see it, um, there is a difference. So this is uh, encouraging because um, that's what you really need to see during formulation, that there is some hints uh, where you can recognize um, and di differentiate between the substances as you go along. Um, so to prevent, again, mistake uh, during the steps. And so um, on the next one, uh, just uh, to illustrate, we overlay um, the vaccine component that you've seen just now, so with the optimized spectrum, and also uh, the raw material. And you see that, yes, indeed, the region is somewhat similar, but there is some differences that you can count on and um, differentiate between the two uh, when working with them. <clears throat> so um, another example is uh, squalene again and um, vaccine buffer, which is um, uh, different salts, but um, nevertheless, they contribute quite a lot. Um, they also contain peptides, so that makes some um, difference. Um, and so, um, again, um, that shows that, yes, even between the compounds, we can differentiate again. This is important. For um, so on the next slide, there is an um, overlay of uh, adjuvant drug substance and formulated vaccines. And I think this is the most important. Because first of all, for us, we check uh, how drug substance looks, but at the same time, uh, we see that some of the peaks from drug substance are present in the um, adjuvanted vaccine, and also the formulated vaccine has a resemblance of the previous, uh, previously um, like where you store raw materials and uh, mix another drug substance. And so as a result, it, it has features of both, uh, but nevertheless it's distinguishable, and this is the uh, key. Uh, to, to control the formation process. So 
um, as a conclusion of part two, uh, we learned that, uh, again, Raman plus is capable to collect distinguishable well-resolved structure in the buffer, in raw material, and vaccine component, and drug product. And drug product is formulated vaccine that you just seen. And so we see um, major contributions in um, between 1,200 and 1,800 reverse centimeters. Um, some of the peaks are quenched, uh, but nevertheless, um, you can distinguish between the compounds and uh, different steps of formulation, and you can use it as a fingerprint. And I think uh, the word fingerprint and Raman is, uh, I think, the, the, the strongest connection. That's where you can differentiate between compounds and yield um, on that. Um, specifically um, with a thought uh, about stability going forward, and of course, a lot to lot consistency. So that's the next two important features that come um, into account. So formulation steps first, but then after stability and lot of consistency. And so um, basically uh, the next steps, um, I think it speaks uh, to develop identity characterization tests for vaccine control process. So basically now we're moving to um, the compounds which are known since 1926. They are used as adjuvants, this is aluminum-based adjuvants, and some of you may be very familiar with it. Um, mostly we used aluminum sulfate in the past, uh, still used in some applications. Um, for most part, at least in our company, we use aluminum phosphate and aluminum oxyhydroxide. And today uh, you will see the examples of aluminum phosphate and raw material. And so um, in the next slide, um, basically I will go straight to the second Panel. There are two panels. So if you take um, aluminum phosphate suspension and measure is this, um, this time we use quartz, um, quartz vial. Um, you see that um, basically pre-treated, um, so just mixed uh, sodium uh, phosphate and uh, aluminum chloride, and um, after treatment, um, and also the um, aluminum phosphate commercial source purchased from the vendor, they all look very similar. They have similar features. It's almost not possible to distinguish between them. So to increase the signal, um, we did dry the sample. And so for dry on the right-hand side, uh, you see uh, that uh, differences start to surface. Here I show only part of the spectrum because um, the part be beyond uh, 1,500 to 3,000 is not really informative. It's flat. And that's why we focus on the um, uh, part between uh, 400 to uh, 1,500 reverse centimeters. So if we click uh, again, yes, um, you see there is an um, overlay there. In, uh, it's in sigma plot. But the purpose of that is to show that there is a um, difference in peak position in the region of 1,000. So this is responsible for PO vibrations, and so PO4. And so this um, basically shows that you can differentiate between pre-treated and after-treatment aluminum phosphate, the one that we prepare here internally in-house, and also commercial source. They're all different. And so we know that after treatment, uh, the PO bond becomes stronger because it shifts. And so um, that's something we uh, um, learn uh, as we observe. But um, how this information can be used? You can use it for lot to lot consistency, obviously. You can use to redesign the process. And also, more importantly, um, is to, to see how uh, different um, source of uh, raw materials may affect uh, the, uh, um, the output, the aluminum phosphate. Um, profile or uh, Raman spectrum of uh, aluminum phosphate um, in the future. So that's what we're currently working on. So we have at least uh, two or three vendors and we're comparing and basically we're building the data. So maybe at some point it would be interesting to share setting um, on different things. And so um, on the next slide, uh, just to show example, this is a raw material, a sodium phosphate, <clears throat> and the raw material purchased from two different vendors. And you can see that uh, the full spectrum, again, you can see that it's only informative all, all the way up to um, up 1,500. Um, so uh, the, the right panel um, is a um, banded view. And so um, you could see that although of the peaks, um, they're similar to a certain extent, 
But if you look closely, there is difference in the peak positions, in the, in the overall shape. Uh, you can differentiate between the vendors. There are subtleties. And so it's important now to learn how the subtleties affect. Um, and we see uh, already differences uh, in the size of the particulates uh, made from two, these two different vendors in aluminum phosphate. We see um, that they react differently during the treatment, and so during the preparation steps. And so now we need to learn uh, whether there is any impact on the binding, on the um, ingenuity. That's something we, we, we need to learn first. And basically the purpose here is to trace back all the way to raw materials in order to um, have um, a good understanding about the process um, uh, to support any changes in manufacturing, any changes of vendors. Um, so that's where the power of the uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy uh, becomes apparent, um, and that's what we're quite uh, happy to learn because it um, gives you opportunity to help and to support um, a process characterization. Now, on the other hand, um, it also introduces controls. And so basically, uh, the ultimate goal is to have different gates. And uh, I think the gate where you check raw materials is the first. And so basically, you can call, um, in this case, uh, Raman application as a guardian uh, that checks um, the quality. And uh, um, based on that, of course, with experience of uh, how, what kind of spectrum you expect to see um, and, uh, and the library. Um, you can decide whether you want to process further this raw material or just stop at the, at the, at the first gate. So that's uh, where we see the power technique, and that's where we want to evolve going forward. So um, again, this is just to highlight the region where we're focusing. And uh, in the summary, um, I think I already spoke that we evaluated it really last March. Um, we brought it in-house in, in September. We started to collect our own data in October. Um, between October and now, we had um, at least opportunity to contribute to three different projects. And one of them is commercialized vaccine. We're very proud of that because um, this is uh, giving uh, opportunity to work with our colleagues and also to see the impact and uh, the need for new technologies um, to be developed in-house. And uh, I think um, um, the next step, as I said, uh, is to um, develop further, to build our library, and to build experience with um, different vendors um, and see the impact on the output um, working progress, like intermediate and the final product. And um, I think at this point, I uh, would pass it to Don. And um, uh, thank you very much. Any questions, I guess um, Tarek will, will discuss them. Yeah, after the session. Thank you. Yes, and I, I also forgot to say that um, this is an acknowledgement slide for all people who contributed to the um, um, work. So uh, Bruce is our sponsor, Bruce Karpik. Um, uh, he was instrumental to have this project uh, added uh, earlier last year in the pipeline of the um, technology development project. Um, uh, Kamal and Sasmit already mentioned the um, uh, two key contributors uh, for collecting the data and developing the method. Um, June Bevilacqua is head of uh, analytical R&D, and she helped us to acquire the instrument. And uh, Liliana, Lilian, Ruby, Julie, Jean, and Roger, those people, they, um, they made material for us. So, um, because of them, we had the opportunity to screen so many um, samples and um, participate in three projects and, and learn as we go. With that, now it's to, to Don. Thank you. Hello. So, um, yeah, I'll just, yeah. Uh, I'll just go over this, uh, this question here. So, we've got another poll uh, for the audience now. Um, and that's uh, just before uh, Dawn takes over. So the question is, um, what spectroscopic or analytical technologies do you currently use? And uh, the options there are Raman, FTIR, NIR, NMR, GC slash MS, HPLC, LIBS, titration, or other. 
And uh, just to give the uh, the audience some time to vote, um, Dawn, what do you uh, what do you expect to see from this, from this question? Um, I think I will see NIR, FTIR, um, GCMS, HPLC. Uh, you know, maybe they are they are uh, on the equivalent balance among the top. Maybe um, I I. I would like to see some ramen, yeah. Okay, lovely. Um, so I think that's uh, given the audience uh, enough time to vote now. So let's move on to the results. And uh, well, there you go. Uh, we can see uh, HPLC is uh, sort of in second place, but uh, the most popular answer was indeed ramen. Okay, I'm glad to see this. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Dong Yan. I'm the Applications Manager with BNW Tech. Today I'm going to present a Raman application case using quantitative analysis for online reaction monitoring. This work is done by our application scientist, Philip Joe, in collaboration with one of our customers. The Raman quantitative analysis uses multivariate chemometrics approach. The basic workflow for chemometric model building is first to select samples with verified concentrations that cover the range of the possible changes. With the sample selected, sample spectrum will be collected on Raman spectrometer. Some pretreatment may need to be done to the spectra, such as baseline correction, smoothing, derivatives, or normalization. The model can then be built using algorithms such as PLS regression or PCA. After the model is built, when an unknown sample Raman spectrum is collected and loaded into the model, a prediction of the concentration for the unknown sample will be given. The reaction is from a boron refinement operation it is a crystallizing stage involving the reaction solution containing borate, hot water, sulfuric acid, and other low concentration byproducts. During the reaction, two main chemicals are formed, boric acid and sodium sulfate. The concentrations of boric acid and sodium sulfate are two important variables that need to be monitored. The target concentration of boric acid is between 6 and 8 percent, and the concentration for sodium sulfate is between 22 and 34 percent. Among these two, the concentration of sodium sulfate is most important in order to achieve high reaction efficiency and low waste. If these two concentrations are not within the set control ranges, it would raise the cost of the production. The impact on the cost increase is in the millions of U.S. dollars. The Raman system used is BNW Tech iRaman Plus with 785 nanometer laser excitation. The laser power can reach up to 350 milliwatt. For sampling, an industrial probe with immersion shaft and flow cell are used. The integration time is three seconds. Because the reaction is very slow, the spectral acquisition interval is once every hour. Data collection software is BWSpec, and chemometric software BWIQ is used for model building. For Adline process monitoring, the entire instrumentation is put inside a NEMA enclosure for water and dust proof and working temperature stabilization. The sampling is through industrial probe with immersion shaft coupled with a flow cell installed on a bypass line. 
In the picture on the right side, the red arrow points to the location where the flow cell and the immersion probe are installed. The model buildings are done in two stages. The first stage is to build a model based on data collected in the lab or static sample data collection. In this stage, about 80 samples from reaction solutions were obtained and their Raman spectra were collected inside the lab. The actual concentrations of boric acid and sodium sulfate for these samples were measured by titration and gravimetric analysis as the primary analysis. Chemometric models were then built using BWIQ. In the second stage, which is at-line model building with samples from dynamic fluid, more than 500 samples and their data were collected at line. Simultaneously, the real reaction solutions were sampled from the reaction line and the concentrations were measured by titration and gravimetric analysis. In this second stage, the concentrations in the real reaction solution are close to the target range. The at-line models were then built offline using BWIQ. Some feasibility studies on the reaction solution and its components were done before model building. In this slide, the Raman spectra for boric acid, which is the red line, sodium sulfate, the green line, and the reaction solution, the blue line, are displayed. The peak at 880 is the Raman band for BO stretching bond in boric acid. The peak at 993 is the Raman band for sulfate ion stretching. The spectral regions around these two peaks are chosen to build the models for two variables as boric acid and sodium sulfate concentrations. This slide shows the Raman spectra collected in the lab, which is used for the first stage model building. The calibration curves of two variables, PLS regression, for the lab model are displayed here. The algorithms include baseline correction, Sovistigoli smoothing, standard normal variate normalization, and centering. Both regression curve fittings achieved R squared higher than 0.99 and root mean square error at 0.034 for boric acid and 0.066 for sulfate. The picture in this slide shows how the atline data collection was done for atline model. A large number of spectral data was collected for atline model building. Here it shows the atline model regression curve for sodium sulfate. The R squared dropped to 0.82, and the root mean, root mean square error has increased to 0.58. Several factors may have contributed to this result. One of the major differences between the lab sample and the real reaction solution is the complexity of the real reaction solution in terms of the number of byproducts in the reaction process. This should be the main reason to cause the difference between the lab model and the atline model. For over, the, for over a month, the atline predictions for sodium sulfate using the atline model were carried out in parallel with the existing routine measurement using titration. Both sets of data were plotted on the statistical process control chart. The black dots are the atline Raman measurement, and the red dots are the titration measurement. As you can see that the Raman measurement gives the result very close to the existing measurement for both concentration mean and concentration range. So in conclusion, the Raman quantitative analysis for atline sodium sulfate concentration monitoring 
demonstrates that Raman can be used as an effective secondary quantitative analysis method. Because Raman measurement is quick and non-destructive, it is an ideal tool to use for reaction monitoring. And the small portable Raman system makes the method development and at-line installation very easy. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Dawn. Um, now I believe it's time for the Q&A section. So um, just a reminder to the audience, uh, you're able to ask your questions by typing them into the box at the top left-hand corner of your screen and uh, clicking Submit. So uh, let's, uh, let's start with a question uh, addressed to either speaker, I suppose. Um, as a user, what are the important user specifications that I should consider before purchasing an instrument? Do you want me to answer? I can take a, um, uh, uh, I can answer uh, from from the uh, instrumentation point of view. So I think for the application, um, the the several main important uh, uh, the element of the instrument would be the the laser wavelength and also the resolution and also the laser power. Uh, the range that the, the the instrument will cover that spectral range. Um, yeah, but uh, it's it's a very general question. So uh, we we uh, it's it's better to have some specifics about the application that that we can give a better um, answer. Okay, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, so there's a um, a question specifically for Dawn here. Uh, what is the laser spot size and shape on the sample? Okay, the the laser spot size for Iraman uh, Plus is around 90 micron, and the shape is round. So. All right, lovely. Uh, so the next question is here: um, Have you experimented with any SERS technology? Uh, for example, uh, the use of uh, PSERS by diagnostic uh, ANSERS, cellulose-based uh, PSERS strips, or nano-SERS particle solutions for low-level detection. Source. Yes, yes. We we have we have other applications that use this kind of technology. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, uh, I have questions concerning to the effectiveness of the identification uh, through the different materials used uh, for packing of raw materials. Um, can you repeat that again? Yeah, I can. I'll, I'm just reading this verbatim. Um, I have questions concerning to the effectiveness of the identification through the different materials used uh, for packing of raw materials. Okay, so the packaging, it will really depend on what, what kind of packaging you're using. So um, basically, Raman works with packaging as long as it's transparent, so the laser can penetrate through. So um, it will really depend on what, what you're using. And, um, um, and uh, so far, we've, we've seen people, uh, we, we've seen our customers Packaging um, that works with Raman is a uh, the plastic bags, uh, vials, glass, even brown glass bottles. Lovely, thanks for that. Um, so here's another question for you: um, Has the I Raman been used to measure components in a cell culture media? Yes, I believe so. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so the next question is, um, uh, sorry, the next question is, what type of technologies uh, do you use for compound identity? We? Yeah, is this for Marina? Maybe, maybe well, Marina, you can. Compound, 
Sure, yeah. Depending on the compound, we can use mass spectrometry. That's another unit in biochemistry to, um, platform here um, that works on that. So if you have peptides, raw material, for example, you can confirm identity to the uh, amino acids. Sequence, um, so that's first choice. But of course, if you're talking about raw materials, um, others, you, you do different kind of tools. You can use all, all that chemistry and uh, HPLC, and we use um, gas, um, gas chromatography with mass spec. We don't have it in-house, but we use it extensively. And so, depending on the type of raw material, that's what you um, So, I don't know if it's fully answering, but... That sounded good to me. Uh, yeah. Next question is, can you probe through transparent plastic bags? I think you can. We tried. We tried during yes, the, the answer should be yes, yeah. Thank you, Marina. <laughs> okay. I, I just, uh, I just next question. No, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. Um, I can only say that uh, with the glass vials, um, depending on the uh, thickness of the glass um, and also the intensity of the spectrum, you may see stronger signal or, or, or no signal at all. For raw materials, perhaps it's not that big issue, um, I mean inorganic and organic, but if you're working with biological raw material, it can be issue. So you need to have the vial uh, compatible with ramen. So, uh, for example, we take aliquot and put in our glass vials to measure, and we, or we use quartz to measure. So you need to, to take aliquot of the raw material. Lovely. Thank you for that. Um, so here's another question. Uh, can you spot uh, palm oil uh, hidden in high-cost or high-value oils? That's probably a question for, for the one. Um, I don't have that experience, sorry. Yeah, I think this is this would depend on the concentration of the palm palm oil, right? In the in so um basically the ramen technology, if not without SIRS, uh just the ramen technology it can detect uh the the uh the limit of detection will be above one percent. So this question, this the answer will really depend on the concentration of the palm oil. Okay, lovely. Um, so I've got another question here. What is your experience from Raman spectroscopy? I think this is for Maria. Um, I would say experience meaning just impressions or. Um, overall, I think it's positive. Um, we learned that we can um, basically avoid the glass um, uh, signal in the spectrum if we switch to um, quartz cuvette, and we found quartz cuvette that fits ideally in the uh, holder, in the black holder where you have um, a way to which you connect the laser. So that um, basically gives us better clarity. So potentially in the future, that's what we will uh, share with um, um, with people, and uh, also I um, hope we can publish some of the data. So that gives better uh, resolution. Um, not so much resolution, just you don't see the glass peak anymore, so you don't get destructive by that. Um, but in many cases where we see strong signals from the compounds, glass peak is not an issue. And so it depends. Um, where, where we're going. But um, right now I would say um, we only get more customers who want to uh, have their samples to test and uh, they're challenging us with new projects which we have absolutely no idea will it work or not, but we're willing to try because um, in any case um, you may see, for example, um, buffer components that can be uh, uh, indicative of um, good shelf life or uh, issues, um, you can definitely help to define conditions using Raman um, for, uh, for the uh, mixtures. Um, so we'll see. Right now we have at least two challenging um, questions that we have to answer. Um, but uh, again, it will come with um, a real data and with measurements um, up front. We can only say yes, we'll, we'll be trying. But from what we learned so far, um, I think idea to push uh, Raman as a control factor during formulation, uh, and you can expand further vaccine life cycle. That's really key because 
Um, and that's something one could appreciate going forward, especially from a quality control perspective, that you build quality early on, it goes all the way through the process, and you have some checks and balances uh, as you go, and less puzzles perhaps down the road. So that's, um, that's something we introduced with new vaccine. But uh, with existing, with commercial products, as I said, raw materials is a big um, a topic. And uh, we, we go beyond like what raw material means for our production. Does it uh, change? Does it affect uh, anything during the manufacturing? Um, does it affect the quality of the adjuvant? Does this quality make a difference or not? So all these questions we ask and we, we learn as we go um, at, at present. So. Um, that's uh, that's already two big uh, steps uh, can be uh, can be done by Romans. Overall impressions are good. I think uh, where we're lacking is the modeling that Don showed uh, just now, uh, where we want to work perhaps and learn how to uh, deploy it, uh, how to build it in our system, and so become more familiar and more versatile with that. This is something we don't um, how to say explore yet because uh, we're just learning on principle where we can put this technology to use. But that's something next step we want to learn. Lovely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that answer. Um, so the next question I have here is, what libraries are available with the instrument? Don will answer that. OK. So for Iron Man Plus, uh, we actually have, um, totally, we have a library, uh, a library with more than 14,000 spectra. So, but the libraries, they are packaged in different subgroups. So for specific applications, we'll have a specific subgroup of library for that. For example, for the pharmaceutical, we will have a pharmaceutical library for that. And uh, um, totally, I think we have probably 12 to 15 subgroups that's categorized by applications, and uh, you're welcome to um, sending info re requests to us, and we will give you answers, yeah, uh, specifically for your application. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so the next question I have here is, uh, why would you use dispersive ramen versus FT ramen for the Sanofi application? Marina, I think this is for you. Maybe um, I can I can just say a few words about the uh, dispersive ramen. Okay. Well, so okay. the yeah. So the uh, dispersive ramen is 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 considered a little bit new, comparing uh, with FT ramen, and the the main the main advantage. I mean, it's the uh, um, uh, creation of it is because of the new uh, the new technology in the CCD in the. Uh, semiconductor industry and in the laser. So the dispersive ramen has one big advantage is that it doesn't have moving parts in it. So it, and, and it can be made very small. Um, uh, hence our ramen plus is a portable ramen. And um, yeah, so I will let Marina uh, say, say, uh, say a few words about the, uh, what she sees um, what what she sees the advantage of a portable ramen? I would say uh, our main attraction was portable. The fact that this instrument is portable, and that's uh, I think that was main attraction. I, I think we had the opportunity to explore FT ramen, and um, potentially it's still in case, and uh, we'll do it in the future. But I think uh, don't mention key point. It's not portable. You need to have. Um, cooling the, of detector, you do it only in the lab at the station. And so um, down the road, you don't have flexibility to, um, for example, use the exact same model at the at line or in line. And, and that's where the, um, yes, the limitation is. So we wanted to see how much with um, portable we can do and uh, um, to build that as a potential that this is the model, if it works, uh, if we get um, well-resolved spectrum and it answers our questions, we can recommend it to our um, industrial operation colleagues who can easily deploy it um, 
at line and um, you know control the process at the key steps they they see important. Um, so that that was the real reason. Um, and I think also to exercise um, kind of new concepts we try to invent. It's um, we um, the lab is where we are. So if we go and we can do measurement in the field, and that's something very um, kind of motivating. I think at this point. I don't know if that answers right. the question. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I think we've um, we've run out of time. Uh, so thank you for everyone who asked the question. Um, if we haven't had time to get through to that question, uh, they'll be passed on uh, to the speakers and uh, also to BNW Tech, and you'll uh, hopefully get a response from them uh, in due course. But uh, now uh, that just leaves me to thank uh, Marina and uh, Dawn. Uh, for it was a great presentation, and uh, of course to thank BNW Tech for sponsoring this session. Um, to the attendees, uh, you're going to receive an email uh, very shortly that will tell you how to access the on-demand version of this webinar. Uh, also, you can access it uh, directly through our website, and that website is www.business-review-webinars.com. Uh, once the webinar ends today, uh, the survey will appear in its place, and we would very much appreciate it if you could answer the questions in there. Um, also, uh, don't forget the uh, PDF files available in the resource list, which are free to download. And uh, we look forward to sharing uh, further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website that I just mentioned, and also follow us on Twitter, that's at BRWebinars for daily updates, and of course join our LinkedIn group, that's Business Review Webinars. Uh, speakers, do you have any last minute uh, comments for the audience? I would just like to thank everyone who stayed online and asked our questions. I think the questions were, some of them, very interesting and some just really unexpected. And so it was really uh, interesting to and entertaining uh, to, to learn and um, to, to interact with the audience. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you from me as well. Thank you for, for everyone's attention and questions. Thank you. Oh, and just a last minute reminder to the audience as well, um, you can follow BNW Tech on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, so uh, go ahead and uh, find that. But um, apart from that, thank you very much, everyone, and I uh, hope you all have a nice day. Thank you.